Well, hello everybody. I have again Robert Schwartz. He's the author of Your Soul's Plan. I'm holding right now his book in French and this is why I'm interviewing him again. I'm very, very excited to have you today, Rob. Thank you, Lily. It's good to be back here. Oh, yeah. And I really love what you've learned from all those mediums and working uh, uh, on, on, on discovering what is our pre-birth plan. There's so much knowledge that you've accessed in this process, haven't you? It's, it's a big field. I, I would like to think I've learned a little bit about it, but I know there's a lot more to learn. Yeah. Yeah, obviously. And there is there is... I would like today to discuss... Before we get on the planet, what happens after, what happens during, why some of us are facing some difficulties, really, really big difficulties. So first, let's look at what happens before we get on this planet. Before we get here, we have what I call in the book a pre-birth planning session. And as I understand it, this is a session that occurs in the non-physical realm. Uh, it takes place in, in a room that is created by thought, consensual thought of all those involved. And present at this pre-birth planning session um, are the souls who will be our parents, our children, our spouses, our romantic partners, friends, employers, peers at school, all the significant people from the life to come, as well as spirit guides who oversee the process. And we gather in this pre-birth planning room to discuss all the details of the upcoming lifetime, including the ways in which we are going to challenge each other in order to foster each other's spiritual growth. So is that the role of the soul's plan for, for our evolution? Everything is planned so that we learn some lessons that we need to learn. Well, I wouldn't say that everything is planned, but the major things in a person's life are planned, and many of the details, including where we're going to go to school, where we will live, the specific buildings and so forth, a lot of those details are worked out as well. Mm, and not everybody has a plan, just so that we're clear. No, I think everybody does have a plan, as far as I know, but not everything that happens is part of the plan, and also you can deviate from the plan anytime you want to. We all have free will, so you can deviate from your pre-birth plan in any moment, as much or as little as you like. Ah, uh, interesting. And so, um... So there is different types of. Well, let me let me back up F first. First, our lessons here on the planet. When I read all those different stories that you have in the book, seems to be the big lesson really is unconditional love. Getting back to this natu this this essence that we are. Is that correct? Yes, I I, I think that's correct. Uh, what we found in the pre-birth planning sessions is that souls were planning to experience great challenges in life in order to remind themselves that their true nature is unconditional love. Now, the challenge there is that we all have egos once we get into body. So the ego is, is an energy that tells you you are separate and distinct from everyone else and from God, and that the world is a dangerous place and that you have to fight for yourself, that there are limited resources. So the ego, in some respects, even though it's trying to look out for you, it sometimes has the effect of undermining the pre-birth plan because it takes you away from that inner knowing that you are, at your core, unconditional love. So we plan challenges for ourselves so that we have a choice. We can listen to the voice of the ego or we can listen to our hearts and remember that we are love and then act in a loving manner. So by reconnecting with our heart, that's the access to getting back into who we really are, being in touch back with who we are. I think that's correct. Now, the reason the soul wants to do this, and the reason we come in with amnesia, we forget that we are love on the level of the soul, is that by forgetting and then hopefully remembering that we are love, from the soul's perspective, this leads to a more profound self-knowing. You might think of it this way. If, uh, after the interview today, you were to be hit on the head by a tree branch and you had amnesia, you would forget uh, who you are, and so everyone who loves you would try to remind you of who you are. They would show you every picture, every letter that you had written and received. And you would pay very, very close attention to all these details because you're trying to educate yourself about your real identity. So in a sense, the amnesia motivates you to rediscover who you really are. This is what we are doing in a physical body. We forget that we are the soul. We forget that we are unconditional love. 
And so we go through this process, hopefully, of remembering during the incarnation because after we've remembered, then we have what you might call a more profound or a deeper self-knowing, a deeper understanding of what it means to be love. Makes sense, makes sense, sounds, sounds true. There's, there's some kind of, uh, it, it feels right when you say that. Is, that. is that our soul remembering something that could have happened indeed? <laughs> Yes, I, I think that that's exactly what is happening here. And so, when we return to spirit after an incarnation, if we have made loving choices, from the soul's perspective, this helps the soul to understand what it means to be loved. You know, the soul, as I understand it, is in a realm in which it uh, experiences only love, and so it experiences no contrast to itself. So, by coming here to this realm of duality and experiencing things that are not love, and then choosing love despite those things, that makes it more meaningful for the soul. That gives the soul the experience of choosing love when there is something else. And it's that experience of contrast that helps the soul understand who and what it really is. So do we have, I think I read something along the lines that we, there's different soul groups and... Yes, that's right. Uh, what are those types of, what are we talking about here? Soul group is a collection of souls who incarnate repeatedly with one another and who play every conceivable role for each other. So you and the members of your soul group would be uh, parent and child, siblings, best of friends, enemies, uh, murderer and the one who is murdered. You would play all these different roles to foster each other's evolution. Mm. Now as I understand it, uh, soul groups differ in size. Uh, my understanding is that the average size is 17 souls. Sometimes there are very few, sometimes there are more than 100, but the average is 17. So we would, uh, in, in our lifetime here on the planet, we would meet those souls again and have some kind of karma with them, good, bad? Generally, generally, generally there's, there's karma with the person, which basically means unresolved energy or unbalanced energy. And you set up the life plan so that you will meet the people who are in your soul group with whom you have karma in an attempt to balance the karma. A simple example is uh, two people who had a past life where one was a caretaker and the other was ill. They have unbalanced energy around that relationship and so they might switch roles in order to balance it. So one then plans illness, the other plans caretaking and they just trade places. So how do we recognize each other? How do I know that this other person is part of my soul group? Is it just something that happens when we see them we just know? or? There's, is I, I don't know that you can ever know with absolute certainty, but there are a couple of ways that, that people tend to recognize other members of their soul group. One thing that happens in the pre-birth planning is that souls practice recognizing some identifier. For example, uh, oh, cool. it could be, an article, could be an article of clothing, a particular type of jewelry, uh, an umbrella, a type of shoe, and they will, they will study this in the pre-birth planning so that they recognize each other when they see each other here on the physical plane. The other thing that happens is sort of an intuitive recognition. You meet someone and you just know that you know this person. You don't know how you know, you don't know where you know them from, but it's obvious that, that you know them. That sort of intuitive rec recognition is an indication that you have run into somebody from your soul group who you plan to meet here on the earth plane. Could it be, for example, you meet a man and that man is, is you clearly feel like he's part of your, your soul's plan, but he's married, he has kids, and then you, for many years, and you discuss and you feel like this, this just this knowing, those, those coincidences, the likes, dislikes, the right word, the past, the fantasies, everything corresponds to who you are, but it's just not possible to be physically with them. That kind of thing happens, and that may, that's a good indication that you have run into somebody from your soul group, someone that you've had past lives with. Uh, but just because you recognize somebody like that, that doesn't necessarily mean that you are supposed to be together or that you plan to be together in this lifetime. You might be playing some sort of minor role for each other. There could be many, many reasons why members of a soul group plan to meet each other but not to spend a lot of time together in significant relationship. But my understanding is that once we meet that person then there is a reaffirmation of who you are that is pretty powerful and who you are at your core self and it's nearly like if that soul is there to remind you of your soul's plan, to remind you that you're loved, to remind you that you're on track. 
that that happens but there's also uh, the opposite phenomenon if you are off track there is such a thing as uh, what you might call a bump contract a bump contract means that you have contracted with a member of your soul group prior to birth to bump you back onto your soul's path <laughs> if you've gotten off it and so that person will be vibrationally drawn to you if you've gotten away from the pre-birth plan their function is to remind you of what you came here to do in some fashion so what are in your book you describe quite a lot of experience of people having facing SIDA, having handicapped kids, um, yes. not not being able to see or hear. I mean, really some big life challenges. Why? What would be your advice to people going through s such difficulties in general? The first thing I would say to anyone facing any kind of life challenge is that although it may not seem this way to you. There really is no such thing as random, arbitrary, purposeless, or meaningless suffering. Everything that happens to us in life has some kind of deeper spiritual purpose to it. We often don't know what it is, and when we're in the throes of suffering, we often can't figure out what it is. But I am absolutely convinced that there is no such thing as random or meaningless suffering. The other thing I would say is that if you want to, there are ways that you can figure out what the spiritual meaning of a particular challenge is. One way is to work with mediums and channels, and this was how I researched my book. Another way is to work with an astrologer. Any good astrologer can tell you a lot about your pre-birth plan. A third method is numerology, and you can do this alone yourself with any good numerology book. Add up the numbers in your name, in your birth date, in your family name. You will be amazed at what you can uncover. Uh, a fourth technique is to do it in meditation and there's a particular meditation on my website at yoursoulsplan.com that takes people into the pre-birth planning place so that you can figure out what you planned and then a last method is to ask your soul before you go to sleep at night to send you a dream explaining why something is happening keep pen and paper next to the bed and very often you will get a dream that will answer your question mm. And there's some th th those are amazing. I'm so glad you, you share those. I tried actually the one uh, during the sleep, and it, it is pretty fascinating what you can uh, discover. Tell me though, why do some people really have a soul plan that is destructive for the planet, such as na Nazis, you know, Hitler? I mean, why such uh, cruelty? Why do some people have that evilish, what seems like evil plans? Because there is a lot of people doing some bad too on this planet. The, the souls that come to earth are, tend to be souls who are very courageous and who, for lack of a better word, want to have intense evolutionary experiences. One way to have intense evolutionary experiences is to experience duality, good and bad, love and not love, good and evil. If you're going to have that kind of evolutionary experience, you need somebody to play the quote-unquote evil role. So very often in the pre-birth planning sessions, there are what you and I would consider to be extremely negative or evil roles that are scripted but believe it or not they are actually scripted out of love you will go to someone else in your soul group and you will say would you do such and such an act to me something that would be considered quite negative because and then fill in the blank I want to learn to be unconditionally loving I want to learn compassion I want to experience myself as forgiveness. You can't have yourself, you can't experience yourself as forgiveness in the non-physical realm because no one there is doing anything to you that would require forgiveness. So if you want that kind of evolutionary experience, you have to come here to Earth, to a realm of duality, and you have to have someone play the quote-unquote evil role in your life. Mm. <gasps> So, so, um, and, 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 and you're saying though that we, we do have guides, we do have spiritual guides that we choose before that can help us along this journey. So how can we be in touch right. with them without the role, without a medium interfering or anything? How can we be in the space of our own home, connect with our guide? What are some of the techniques? The best way I think to connect with the guide is through meditation. What meditation really means is that you quiet your external senses, the five senses, so that you can hear your internal senses, your internal voice. Mm -hmm. So in my view, the best way to meditate is to get extremely comfortable so that you're not aware of your surrounding environment. Uh, close your eyes, use your plugs if you want to, turn off the lights, uh, and then just allow your mind to clear. If any thoughts come by, don't fight them because then you strengthen them. Just let them drift by as though they're drifting along on a river. Eventually, you'll get to a place where your mind is quiet. 
and then you can hear your guides. You can pose a question. Go into the, med the meditation with a particular intent to get a certain question answered. The intent will drive the energy behind the meditation. Now at first, you may not hear anything. But over time, you might start to hear, say, a one or two word answer or some kind of a feeling comes in response to your question. And then over more time, you start to hear more words or you get a clearer feeling or a clearer image. And so gradually, you open up your psychic senses and you can hear what your guides are trying to communicate with you. And be assured that in every meditation, when you set a clear intent to talk with the guide, your guide is there and your guide is communicating with you. So just stick with it. Over time, you'll hear them. Mm. And so were you saying earlier that if we were in a place uh, where uh, with, if I was communicating right now with Stacy, which is one of your mediums in the book, you actually, I think, have four mediums that have been working right. on each of those plans. If I would be speaking with Stacy right now, she could tell me my, my uh, pre-birth plan and then I would know my biggest challenges and then know ahead of time what's going to happen? Well, not not so much ahead of time. Very often, if you ask spirit through a medium or a channel what's going to happen, you won't get an answer. And this happens all the time in the sessions that I do as part of my research. The reason you don't get an answer is that it's not for your highest and greatest good to know what's going to happen. Because then you start to make decisions based upon what you've been told. And if you've planned a particular experience that may be painful but for your own le learning and growth, then you try to avoid it then you sidestep the learning and growth, and then your whole purpose for coming here has been negated. So very often spirit won't answer that kind of question, but what Stacy can find out, her particular skill is that she both sees and hears the conversations we have with one another before birth. She can actually go into the pre-birth planning session in the room where we're all talking with our future parents and children and so forth, and hear word for word the conversations that we're having. She also sees the soul's uh, doing what she calls trying on the cloak of the personality. In other words, the soul goes from being a sort of a, a ball of energy to a light body form of the, um, the body that it's going to create in the lifetime. So it tries on the personality for size and she reports seeing souls uh, touch each other in certain ways to share their energy or reassure each other about the upcoming life plan. It's a fascinating glimpse uh, into the other side, and I'm always amazed at what she's able to see and hear. Yeah, weren't you amazed? How was how was your experience of participating to such an experience? I mean, what was what, what was well, it like to speak directly with spirit through those people? Because you were asking those questions yourself, weren't you? Yes. Well, we we do two things in the sessions with Stacy. We talk with her spirit guide who can answer specific questions about why a particular challenge was planned before birth. And then we go into, as I said, the pre-birth planning sessions where she actually sees and hears the conversations we're having with each other. For me, this, this was a, a thrilling experience. There was one session um, in, the, in the first book uh, in which we were talking about Christina, an American woman who plans to be in a bomb explosion. And when we went into Christina's pre-birth planning session, I was there, which was quite a shock to me. And I go up to her after she has planned to be in the bomb explosion and I say, I'm aware of what you are planning. I'm planning to write books about pre-birth planning. May I share your story in a book that I'm going to, to write? And Christina says, yes, absolutely, let's do it. So that, that was quite a shock to me to find myself there. And yet, now that I've learned what I've learned about pre-birth planning, in some ways it's not a surprise at all. Yeah, well, it seems that uh, in all those people's life, because you have selected those 10 people among, I think, thousands or hundreds at least, and then you you, you played a major role in helping them uh, sh change their view of life around, haven't you? I mean, w what was the outcome of all of them after after meeting you and through talking to this medium? Were they expecting such a thing? You know, I think the, the effect that this work has had varies from person to person. Uh, one thing I did in my book is that I, I did not want to interview only true believers, so to speak. I didn't want to interview only people who absolutely believed in the reality of pre-birth planning because that's not representative of the population as a whole. So there are people in the book who believe in it, who don't believe in it, and who aren't sure what to think about it. They cover the entire spectrum.
-hmm. Christina, the, per the woman who was in the bomb explosion, is someone who is convinced of pre-birth planning, but that has nothing to do with me. It's because after she was blown up in that bomb explosion, the explosion had the effect of opening up her psychic gifts. She became clairaudient and started to talk with her guides who told her while she was in the hospital, you planned this experience. So she knew about pre-birth planning decades before I ever interviewed her for the book. Her guides gave her her entire pre-birth plan, which was to become a gifted healer as a result of learning about healing after the bomb explosion. So when, by the time she met me and did her interview for the book, she knew all about it. So is it true that uh, the, uh, the love has healing powers? I think that love is the most powerful force in the universe. And I think that when we come into remembrance of ourselves as love, that is really the way that we heal the challenges in our lives. Basically, as you act in a more and more loving manner, you are raising your frequency, your vibration. And as you do that, physical illness starts to fall away because it can't exist at a higher vibration. A lot of the sort of emotional challenges we face just start to dissolve. It's really by raising our vibration that we can best tackle the challenges of life. Hmm. And so what happens if, let's say, we lived up to our soul's plan? So let's say we graduated and we did learn unconditional love. What, what happens then? Do we die and then evolve into that new dimension? Or do we actually continue on this path on the planet? I mean, <laughs> what, what well, happens? Basically, basically, it's up to you what you would like to do next. There is a woman uh, in my book... It's in the story on the pre-birth planning of drug addiction, a woman, Sharon, who uh, plans before birth uh, that she and her son, Tony, he will have a heroin addiction. He actually plans this on his own, and then he goes to her and says, would you be the mother who guides me through this drug addiction? Now, we find out in the pre-birth planning session that Sharon is a highly evolved soul who doesn't need to reincarnate. But out of her great love for Tony, who is in her soul group and with whom she has had many previous lifetimes, she says, yes, I will agree to do this for you. So she comes back into body even though she doesn't need to. Now, she could easily have chosen just to go on to a quote-unquote higher dimension. What happens in the higher dimensions, I don't know. I haven't researched that. But eventually I know that we all do get off the wheel of reincarnation. We do go on to these so-called higher dimensions. Mm. So we keep on reincarnating until... Until 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 we're ready for for something else. Until we really learn learn those lessons. Yes, unless you're someone like Sharon who wants yeah. to be of service to another soul, and then you might choose to come back into body anyway. And then and then I think you mentioned something like we could become uh, spiritual guides for others afterwards too. Well, my my understanding is that members of a soul group will sometimes act as spirit guides to each other. So you might, uh, after this lifetime, decide to be a spirit guide to someone else in your soul group, and then after that person's lifetime is over, you might then come back into body for another incarnation. Because you know yourself And then that so person well. could be your spirit guide. Yeah, because you know yourself, you know each other so well. That's right. That's exactly right. Ah, is there any way we can um, uh, do an incantation to uh, attract our soul souls to soul group to show up? <laughs> you mean to meet the other members of the soul group? Yeah. You know, intent is really the thing that, that drives what happens in the world. Intent and focus are the two prime determinants of how energy flows. So if you are someone who would like to meet the other members of your soul group, set a clear intent that that is what you want. The universe will recognize your intent, and if you stay focused on it, if you attend to it, then it will happen. Ah. So there's, there's unlimited, I hear unlimited, unlimited power. I think that's true. You know, uh, the story of Christina, uh, who I plan to tell in the book, when we did the sessions with the mediums, I said, how did Christina and I know that we would ever meet each other? Because she lives very, very far away from me. And the response was, and I quote, it is the sea of vibration, the vibrations brought you together. And that really is how it works. Everything in the world is energy vibrating at a certain frequency, and like frequency will attract like frequency. That's how Christina and I found each other. So what would be your, um, your last word here and your, your, your message in general that you would love... Uh uh, people to, to, to get here. 
the the most important message I can share with anyone is to say to you you are not your body you are not your personality the body and the personality are things you have but it's important to understand that just because you have a thing that doesn't mean you are the thing you have in other words if you have a horse that doesn't mean that you are a horse and by the same token just because you have a body and you have a personality that doesn't mean that you are the body or the personality in my view you're not who are you then well from my perspective you are soul you are soul mm, thank you and um, if you guys want to find out more about uh, your soul's plan then I encourage you to read his book uh, Robert's book and you have it in French Les âmes courageuses <laughs> for our French viewers thank you so much Rob for sharing all this wisdom you're very welcome thank you